So uh, welcome to our um, lecture number 81. Uh, we are about to study chapter 35 of, of the second book of the guide. Uh, we are uh, at, um, it's at page 367 in book two of the Pines edition. Um, uh, it's chapter 35. And, uh, so this and what we just learned, uh, and Rama was kind of getting us set up for this big discussion he's going to spend in the next several chapters, uh, the issue of prophecy, how prophecy works. Um, now, <clears throat> The um, if you remember, I can't remember. It was a couple chapters ago where Ramam gave three uh, three opinions about prophecy. Right, the one opinion was the idea that um, that of the simple masses. Right, the idea that you know God decides to talk to somebody. You know, in which case, of course, he can decide to talk to anybody. Right, and whoever God decides to talk to, he talks to him or her and or it and gives him a prophecy, and then that prophecy comes out. Right. And uh, the other approach was what he called the approach of the philosophers, which was the idea that um, that after perfecting one's intellect and so on, one taps into this knowledge of God, and it's something that comes naturally, something that, you know, so one way of understanding those two different ideas, right, and then Ramam had a third way, which we'll get to in a second, uh, is the supernatural approach to prophecy versus the naturalistic, scientific approach to prophecy. The supernatural approach is God decides to talk to you. And the, and the, the natural approach is, is that it's really a scientific phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that when one, through perfecting his or her um, moral and ethical self and intellectually achieves a certain level, they will automatically achieve that level and gain access to this divine knowledge or divine wisdom, which would be called prophecy. Rambam gave a, 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 try to think for a minute about the ramifications of taking either approach, right? The ramifications of taking the approach of the simple-minded folk that think that God decides to speak to something or someone, right, is that uh, it, it, such a person would be much more apt to take a leap of faith, listen to something that might not necessarily make sense, right? Um, you know, if he doesn't, he or she doesn't understand the mitzvah and the Torah, they'll be easy to say, oh, it's just because God said so, right? Whereas the person who understands it as a result of, of a accumulation of knowledge and wisdom and experience and morals and ethics and so on would have to understand that wisdom to be a result of the accumulation of all that knowledge. It would be a wisdom that makes sense. And you wouldn't say take a leap of faith. It would be something that makes sense. Bear in mind the difference between these two approaches as we learn how Rambam understands prophecy. The Rambam then said he has his own approach, which he says is our approach, which is kind of a third way. And the third way was is that no, pro God, prophecy is a result of all of that work. So it is naturalistic in that sense. It's a, it's a way that, however, God can decide who gets access and who doesn't, right? In other words, a person can achieve that high level, right? And he, he, he or she can spend his whole life studying and working and so on and so forth and be and seem to us to be worthy of prophecy, but still not be there, right? Still not get access it, right? There's something that comes from above that God says, okay, I'll let you, but I'll not let you. Now, interestingly, as we go through the Rambam, it'll seem more and more clear that somehow, um, somehow this is... Uh, uh, the Rambam leans much more towards the naturalistic side than to the supernatural side, right? In other words, more and more, it's going to he's going to emphasize the process of becoming a prophet, how one becomes a prophet, how prophecy works, and so on, right? So, to the extent that some say that uh, uh, that that the when when Rambam says God decides, right, as to who's not going to be a prophet, Rambam is going to drop us hints, and we'll get to some of them tonight, hopefully. And say, well, a person can't be a prophet if he's sad. A person can't be a prophet if he's mad. A person can't be a prophet if he's jealous. A person can't be a prophet if he's, if he's, uh, you know, any number of, of things, right? So uh, if he's impatient, if he's, and so on and so forth, right? It's almost as if he's telling us that 
that God built into the nature of the universe, right? That a person can be a great genius, right? But if he's morally not 100%, he won't be a prophet. And that if you remember, Ramam said, he said this before, and he's going to say it again in several places, that the way God works through creation is because when he created the world, he set up the world that such and such and such things would happen as a result of such and such and such and so on, right? So if we naturalistically arrive at the level of prophecy, but we're not, we didn't really arrive at the level of prophecy because we're not morally all there, then we won't be a prophet. And that's God's way of choosing, so to speak, right? That so-and-so should not get prophecy. But we're going to, and what I just told you was uh, uh, Yosef Ibn Kaspi, who was a 13th century philosopher, a strong Maimonidean, he explains Rambam that way. That when what Rambam is really holds is the position of the philosophers. He just adds that when you and I see someone who might be a big genius, but if he's a selfish fill in the blank, right, then he's just not going to, you know, or, or if he has a tiny flaw, that he will not be able to achieve it. And why morals and ethics are so important, and it's not just you can't get the prophecy with just wisdom, will become very clear as we understand and learn to the Rama. That's one introduction I want to make. A second introduction I want to make is, is Rambam's uh, uh, psychological theory, so to speak. If you remember learning, uh, if you ever learned about Freud's, you know, id and superego and ego, right? Rambam had a, a two-part understanding of how, of how the human psych, psyche worked, right? There's what we're, he's going to call it, according to the, this translation, um, the imaginative faculty and the rational faculty, okay? Now, if you remember, Ramam talked about the intellects, right, that decide to do things, right? That's right. A human being decides, I am going to walk across the street, right? There's the rational intellect. There's also the intellect that decides to make the spheres go around, right? And the ultimate, ultimate active intellect, of course, is God himself, who decides to make the entire universe exist, right? And Ramam talked about how the intellect, you know, from above, it goes lower and lower and lower and lower until it gets to us. So there's the active intellect. That is the thing in our brain which thinks, which thinks, okay, I'm hungry. I need food. What's the right way to get food? Well, I need to go get a job. I'll earn a few bucks. Then I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'll buy it and I'll bring it home, right? That's the rational faculty goes through these decisions and we decide to do certain things we decide on a much higher level, that same rational faculty starts to think, well, what's the right way to live my life? Where should I live? What kind of community should I live? In? What kind of friends should I have? What kind of activities should I involve myself in? Right. You know, why, why, why are things the way they are? And then you start doing scientific research and studying Torah and learning and understanding. So that the rational faculty is doing that active thinking. That's the active intellect. It's act called active and it's called the rational faculty because it's actively thinking and deciding what to do. Then there's this other thing that's called the imaginative faculty. The imaginative faculty is the thing that most of us don't really have control of. It's the thing that happens most classically when we close our eyes and and we dream, right? Right? It's just what our brain is doing, right? And that imaginative faculty, right, is full in most of us of our desires our wants, our needs, our imagination of how things could be, right? We could be thinking about um, the things that come in are, you know, I would like to be the president so I can be the boss and tell everybody what to do. I would like to be the, the, the general so I can command big armies and blow things up. I would like to be the one who, you know, if, if whatever person's sexual desires are going to come in. I want this. This is These are the things that I want. I want a giant uh, corned beef every night. I want, I need, I have, you know. And that imaginative faculty is imagining all the things that we want. Sometimes we can imagine nicer things. We can imagine beautiful mountains and rivers and streams. So our imagination is not necessarily bad, but it's the thing that our brain does when we're not controlling it, right? So what we're going to learn in chapter 36, right, is um, is uh, is um, is going to be, it's important to keep that in mind. Okay, so when we get to, we have to do chapter 35 first. Another introduction before we do 35 is is um, is for for Rambam's whole this whole book right the guide of the perplexed is to tell those of us right who believe in the Torah right right who who Rambam is a rabbi he's teaching us how to practice Judaism right so Judaism has to make sense right 
and how do you how what happens when it doesn't seem to make sense it seems to conflict with with the with knowledge with science etc that's what this book is about right so for torah to make sense there has to be something special about the torah itself right and what's the torah the torah is in all it, when when you boil it down it's the teaching that moshe gave us in the name of god right through moshe rabbeinu right in other words ramam explained to us before that even the aseras adibros right we received through moshe right god spoke to moshe and moshe gave it to us right so and there is no other figure like this right all the other prophets taught us lessons taught us a lot of things and gave us a lot of ideas and prophecies and taught us a lot about how we should live or how we shouldn't live etc but moshe is the only one that gave us this torah these laws this way to live this way of life this religion right so moshe then is more than just a prophet right moshe is on a completely different level and remember there's also the underlying thing here of of what about the others who claim to have supplanted moshe remember ramam was living in a world where where one religion islam was claiming that muhammad supplants moshe right and is now the prophet right and and christianity is claiming that jesus supplants moshe right so 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 Raman has to explain why Moshe has is something special. He's going to say it in 35, but we're not going to really understand it until we really go through a lot a lot more of this book. In fact, I would venture to argue that to really understand chapter 35, you have to stick with me until the end of the entire book of the guy, right? I know so that you have to now listen to the whole thing, right? Because um He's going to say it, but you're not going to understand. Well, why? Why? What is, makes Moshe special? Why? If, if Moshe is so great, the one question that we're going to ask ourselves that we won't have the answer to at the end of the chapter is, if Moshe is so great and prophecy is something that human beings achieve on their own through their own work, their own moral achievements, ethical achievements, who's to say, thanks, Billy, I'm, I hope everyone here will be in to the end. Then who's to say, and Yosef, I'll get to you in a second. Who's to say that someone else won't come up next year, right? Who's to say that, you know, you know, that Jesus didn't achieve that level and now he could beat out Moshe and tell us new lessons? Who's to say that Muhammad can't? Who's to say that Joe Schmo next year, or whatever prophet you find on the corner of Times Square, whoever that might be, who's to say that that guy didn't achieve the level of Moshe and can now teach us things that Moshe didn't? That question we won't have an answer to at the end of 35, other than that's the way it is. But I, but I promise you, I, I can't promise you that you'll be satisfied with the answer. But I can promise you that you will, that you will understand it only as we seriously go through. Because I, I would venture to, 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 to claim that the entire book three of Moranavuchen, which is an explanation of the logic behind the entire Torah and why the Torah is so important in bringing ethical and moral lessons to to live by for the entire world, why the Torah is the start and the basis, that is the demonstration of why Moshe is special and different, right? Because, because what Moshe said in motion, right, it's something that no other, everyone else since him is riding on his shoulders. And, and uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that. But so I just wanted to, these are just introductions. Now that we have the introductions, I'll, I'll go to the hand that's up and then, and then we'll, we'll do start chapter 35. Go ahead, you'll see. So, Rabbi Dr. Shul, uh, that's almost exactly what I wanted to say, which is that even if somebody comes and says something else, we don't have to believe them because we have our faith. And therefore, since we have the fundamentals of faith that Moshe Rabbeinu gave us, we don't need to suspect that there's other options because maybe there are, but they're not for us. Yeah, that well, that's that's a good point. It's definitely a good point. And um, and uh, and uh, but the, the but the main point that I mean, Ramam is going to emphasize that there is no no one else can claim to be the level of Moshe. And and but let's see. So so go let's read thirty five. I've already explained to to all the four differences by which the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu is distinguished from the prophecy of others. Right? We talked about it back in um, you know in 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 book one. So that Moshe spoke to God face to face, whatever that means. He heard directly from God, not in a vision. The Moshe was able to on demand talk to God. It didn't just happen. It was something that he was able to go and talk, right? But this, so these are things that we explain. And 
I have proved it and made it manifest in the commentary of the Mishnah, Mishnah Torah. Go look there in Hilchas Yisodei Torah, right? And, and you'll see it, uh, and so on. You, uh, I, I made a mistake when I said in book one. It's not there. It's in the other books that the Ramam wrote. Accordingly, there's no need to repeat it. Moreover, it does not enter into the purpose of this treatise. To sit and, and line up the differences between Moshe uh, and the other prophets doesn't have a point place here. I will let you know that everything I say on prophecy in the chapters of this treatise refers only to the form of prophecy of all the prophets who were before Moshe and will come after him. So I'm about to describe to you, the only thing I'm going to describe to you is everything except for Moshe. The nature of Moshe's prophecy, I'm not going to talk to you about, right? It's a different category. It's something else. I'm not discussing it. I'm talking about all the other prophets, which, which to me that says the Ramam is saying, I'm going to talk to you about the kind of prophecy that you and I have access to in some way, shape, or form, right? I'm not saying that you and I are necessarily going to be prophets, but the prophecy that every human being can on some level achieve if, if all the circumstances are right, right? As for the prophecy of Moshe, I'll so not touch upon it in these chapters with even a single word, either an explicit or in a flash. In other words, I'm not even going to hint towards Moshe's, right? That's a different ballgame. For to my mind, the term prophet used with reference to Moshe and the others is amphibolous. In other words, right, remember how Ramam says you can use one word and it can mean two different things. So when we call Moshe Rabbeinu a prophet and when we call Isaiah a prophet, we mean two different things. They're, they're two different things. Moshe was one thing and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, those were different things, right? The same applies, in my opinion, to his miracles and to the miracles of others, right? For his miracles do not belong to the class of the miracles of the prophets. When Moshe performed a miracle, it was a different kind of miracle. And and one, and you can start seeing a little bit of a hint of what I was saying and what he's saying here, um, about in a minute. Uh, because what Moshe's miracle, we're going to find out in a minute, was different because Moshe's miracle was meant to teach the entire world a lesson. Moshe's Moshe's prophecy was meant to change the entire world, change the entire path of morality and ethics for the entire world, right? That made, Mo and it's the same thing with Moshe's miracles. His miracles were meant to, to, to change the world, right, in ways that the other prophets were not. The proof taken from the law as to his prophecy being different is because God said, you know, I appeared unto Abraham, but, you know, I didn't use the, the word Hashem uh, Hashem. It informs us that his apprehension was not like that of the patriarchs. The way Ramam understands that verse is that that uh, that Moshe saw God in a different way than the other prophets did. Um, as for the difference between his prophecy and those who came after, it says there has not arisen a prophet since Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Okay, that I, I just turned the page to 368. Thus it has been made clear that his apprehension is different to that from that of all those who came after him, which is, you know, even though it says, you know, uh, uh, right, right, even though among all, you know, uh, the prophets of the people of Israel is God exists, but he was different nonetheless, and all the more so the operation of those that came from other religious communities. Again, Ramam is granting that a prophet can arise under the right circumstances from the other nations. If a person were to perfect himself or herself on a, an emotional, uh, uh, a moral, ethical, and intellectual level, one can achieve that level because, again, it's naturalistic. There's no reason why it should be only among Jews. It could be among anyone. As for the different, but, but if among Jews God didn't appear like he did with anyone else to Moshe, then certainly among no one else. As for the difference between his miracles in general and those of every prophet, what about the miracles? It should be said that all the miracles worked by the prophets before them were made known to a few people only. Almost all the miracles you find happened in a specific instance with a specific set of onlookers, right? They were in per interpersonal miracles. Think of the Elisha and the woman with the jug of oil or something. It happened between those two. In fact, it was just a, you know, it, it was, in fact, it was kept secret from most of the other people around. And the only ones that saw and knew were the ones that were there, right? Or the ones to whom it was supposed to be revealed for whatever reason that that, that prophet felt and God felt it was appropriate for that person to learn that lesson. So do you see that the king of Israel inquired about them asking Gehazi to communicate them information about them? For he says, and he, um, you can read the verse, the same holds good for the signs of all the prophets except for Moshe. That's true if you look through all the prophets. Now, how well that holds up, you can go through everything yourself and see whether you think it's really 
true that it holds up to every miracle, but the Ramam is saying that it does, so you just have to take his word for it, right? That every other miracle is 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 just for those individuals involved. For that reason, scripture makes it clear, likewise, by way of information with reference to him, that no prophet will ever arise who will work signs both before those who are favorably and those unfavorably disposed towards him. I was done by Moshe. Moshe's miracles were everyone saw, the good guys and the bad guys, because it was a lesson for everyone in the world to learn, right? This is the meaning of the dictum, and there hath not arisen a prophet since, and so on, and all the signs and wonders, and so on, in the sight of Israel. For here it establishes a connection and a tie between the two notions. Namely, there will not arise someone who will have an apprehension similar to Moshe, and there will not arise someone who perform miracles similar to Moshe. Thereupon, it makes clear that those signs were worked in front of Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, who were unfavorably disposed to him. In other words, even those that weren't interested in learning the lessons of Torah, Pharaoh and his servants were interested in enslaving the Jewish people. They weren't interested in learning about God. But God, nonetheless, showed them these miracles in order for them to learn the lesson, right? So this was a thing that had not happened to any prophet before him. The first thing that might come to mind is, of course, Eliyahu and Hara Carmel, Elijah and Mount Carmel, where, where the impression that we have in our minds is the impression of masses of people watching, especially mass. And there were also all those followers of Baal who were watching. So this seems to contradict that. You should not, uh, um, but, well, Ram is going to get to that in a minute, but but also the idea of, of in Joshua's time when God made the sun stand, surely if the sun stops, the whole world noticed that the day's longer. So, so Rama says you should not be led astray by that which is said with regard to the light of the sun standing still for Joshua for certain hours. Uh, for it does not say all Israel, right? It doesn't say that all of Israel saw it. The only people that noticed were the people that were there at the battle. Similarly, Elio on our Carmel performed his actions before a small number of men. It, there were there was a bunch of people watching, but it was not everyone. It wasn't the whole community. It was a few people that came to watch. Presumably people that actually wanted to learn, right? Is God the real one or is Baal the real one, right? And those people that were watching saw the miracle. I said certain hours, when going back to the sun thing, because it appears to me that the words kayom tamim mean as the longest day that may happen, for tamim means perfect. It was as if it, it said that the day of Gibbon was for them as the longest of the days of the summer that may occur there. So what they experienced was not even a day that was necessarily miraculous. It was a day that was as long as a day could possibly be. Bottom line is, don't worry about those those problems. I still stand by what I say, Ramam says, that Moses' miracles were different. After the prophecy and the miracles of Moshe have, in accordance with my injunction, been set apart in your mind. Okay, now that we remove that from your brain, right? Take Moshe, put him in a different category. Um, seeing that the extraordinary character of his apprehension is similar to the extraordinary character of his actions, Moshe was in a different class. And after you have come to believe that his is a rank that we are incapable of grasping in his true reality, now you shall hear what I say in all these chapters about prophecy and the degree of the prophets in respect of prophecy, all these degrees being after this degree of Moshe. This was the purpose of this chapter. I, in other words, I told you this chapter to take Moshe out of your mind to take Moshe's miracles out of your mind. And even though I didn't explain it, he did nothing in this chapter to explain to us exactly what it was that Moshe achieved and how he achieved it and why and what, what made it different. All I'm telling you is that it's different and I'm not going to talk about it. So let's talk about um, uh, the, 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 other, the other prophets and how that works. Um, so, so chapter 36 is, a, is one of the most important. I mean, there's a lot of them, but... But there's a lot of stuff in this chapter, and hopefully we'll get through it tonight. Um, that that is very important. Now, bear in mind what I told you about about the active intellect, right? Which which is the active intellect um, that the the intellect that makes decisions, that makes things happen, right? And that we have within us, right? Which uh, which is also which is also cars. It, it, depending on the context, it could refer to to God as being the active intellect. That runs the entire universe, right? And now remember, this was not in the Rambam's mind. This was a a concept of physics, right? The active intellect comes from the Aristotelian idea of what's powering the universe, right? This was not a concept of um of uh, of, of of spirituality per se, right? Um, and then and the intellect within us, right? Okay, so let's 
uh, or which was also called the rational faculty. That's the little bit that we have that gets influenced by the spheres above us, which are influenced by the spheres above them, which are influenced by the spheres above them, and so on, all the way back to God, right? We have that little bit within us that is our active intellect, our rational faculty, which thinks and makes decisions and, and decides on how we're going to act and what we're going to do and how we're going to live. So the true reality and quiddity of prophecy consists in its being an overflow overflowing from God. It's reiterating what I said and in, in what, I, what I just said. May he be cherished and honored through the intermediation of the active intellect toward the rational faculty in the first place, right? That's how it goes into our brain. In our brain, our rational faculty is directly being influenced by that at rational faculty, that active intellect that started with God. Within us, you know, and this, if this sounds similar to the Kabbalistic concept of chilek el kamimal, a piece of God from above that, that resides with us in our soul, then, then so be it. So it's similar, okay? But the Ramam is saying this on a, on a, on, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, on a level of physics, right? This is how our, so our brain has that active capacity of thinking and therefore deciding to do and making us do stuff, right? And thereafter toward the imaginative faculty. And then that rational faculty can then control or have influence upon our imaginative faculty. Remember, our imaginative faculty is that part of the brain that, that had within resides. There was a point, I forgot which chapter, where Rambam equated the imaginative faculty with the Yetzer Hara, right? With the evil inclination. The imaginative faculty, which is the, that which drives us to do bad, right? But, but the rational faculty, faculty can influence it or can be influenced by it, depending on, on how we run it. So, so if you, um, that imaginative faculty is the, is the part of our brain that, that imagines and dreams and thinks and wants and desires and so on, all of that is in the imaginative faculty. It's not being controlled by us. It's the stuff that goes on in our brain, right? So, but if we can take that rational faculty, right, and control the imaginative faculty, right, then we will have achieved prophecy. I know that the whopping sentence I just said. So hold that sentence as we read the rest of the chapter and think about it. This is the highest degree of man and the ultimate term of perfection that can exist for a species. And this state is the ultimate term of perfection for the imaginative faculty. This is something that cannot by any means exist in every man. The ability for the rational faculty to control the imaginative is something that not every person can do. And it is not something that may be attained solely through perfection in the speculative sciences and through improvement of moral habits. Simply by just learning a lot of science and knowing a lot of stuff and being a basically good person is not enough to really control that imaginative faculty. When you turn, when you close your eyes and turn off your brain, most of us still have some selfish desires, still have needs and wants that are not necessarily in, in, in a full compliance with what a moral, ethical, and intellectually perfect person should should be, right? Even if all of them have become as fine and as good as can be, right? It takes more than that. There is still is needed, in addition, the highest possible degree of perfection of the imagined faculty in respect of its original national disposition, right? That imaginative faculty has to become perfect, right? It has to be perfect so that when you close your mind, you're not dreaming about corn beef or you're not having dreams about illicit sexual desires, right? But you're having dreams about about images of of world peace, right? Or images of of perfection, of 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 true compassion, images of of love towards God and love of humanity, images of of a, of a better future for the world. That's when you get to that point, you're getting close to to where you'd be on the level of prophecy, right? When you're not thinking about yourself, and I say that it's not just me saying. You'll see how the Ramam deals with this in a minute. Now, you know that the perfection of the bodily faculties to which the imagined faculty belongs, right? Right. The imagined faculty, the Ramam says, is part of our bodily stuff, right? We have, uh, we have organs, right? And in this case, we have a brain. And this is what the brain does. It thinks about what it wants, right? Right. And the brain thinks about, oh, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I want to have sex, I want to, the things that our brain thinks it wants to do, right? Our brains think that way. That's what our brains do, right? Um, so any bodily faculty, it's consequent upon the best possible temperament, the best possible size, the purest possible matter. So the, the arm, for example, would have to be the right size arm, 
the right type of arm, be made out of the right stuff in order to do the best arm functions. The same thing, the brain it has to be the right size brain, the right type of brain, made out of the right of stuff, right? I mean, what we would say today, it has to have the right DNA, right? That makes it up, right? It's not a thing whose lack could be made good or whose deficiency could be remedied in any way, I mean, the regimen. If you have an arm that's deficient, a person that, you know, you know, Olenu is born with the deformed arm, the arm is deformed, it can't become a perfect arm. The arm itself, you can work with it and try to use it at its best possible, but it's never going to be perfect if it's physically deficient, right? So our imaginative faculty has to have the right stuff, right? So with regard to a part of the body whose temperament was bad in the original natural disposition, if you had a bad part of the body to begin with, the utmost, the corrective action, right, is to keep it in some sort of health, but it can't make it the best possible. If, however, its defect derives from its size, position, or substance, I mean the substance of the matter from which it is generated, there is no device that can help. I just turned to page 370. You know all this. It's useless to explain it at length. You can't take something that's inherently bad, right, and make it into something good. If you have a car and it's a Toyota, a little Toyota from 1980, you can't make it into a 2024 Maserati, right? You can't. You can fix the Toyota so that it runs, right? And that it turns right when you go right and left when you go left and forward when you hit the gas. But you can't turn it into uh, it just and something that it's not, right? So in other words, it's so your imaginative faculty has to start out with the right physical qualities. You know, too, that the actions of the imaginative faculty that are in its nature, such as retaining things perceived by senses, what does the imaginative faculty do? It smells something mm, that smells good, right? Right. It sees something. Ooh, that looks nice, right? Uh, it feels something. Oh, that feels good, right? And the imaginative faculty starts saying, oh, I like this, right? Or the opposite. Uh, I don't like this, right? This doesn't look good. This doesn't feel good, right? This doesn't smell good, right? So, so it combines these things and imitates them. And then within the imaginative faculty, thoughts of those things that it's experiencing in the world around it start to bounce around, right? And you know that its greatest and noblest action takes place only when the senses rest and do not perform their actions. When you go to sleep and you turn off all those senses and there's no external stimuli, now that imaginative faculty really goes to work, right? Um, it is then that a certain overflow overflows to this faculty according to its disposition, and that's the cause of veridical dreams. In other words, dreams, truthful dreams, where our, our brain goes to where our brain wants to go on its own. Right. In other words, this part of the brain, this same overflow is the cause of prophecy. This dream is right, is the cause of prophecy. Now, how could that be? Is every dream prophecy? Well, let's see. Let's see how that works. There's a, only a difference in degree, not in kind. Right. So this imaginative faculty that our brain is, is, is thinking of things. Right. Right. That, that we don't necessarily perceive because we worked out the mathematical formula to get us to that conclusion. There's just the, that wisdom that's in there, right? That's prophecy. That's a strong statement. So, you know, as sages have said, a dream is the 60th part of prophecy. But there's a problem, right? No proportion, however, can be established in two things differing in their species, right? Right? Um, so so, so if, if, if two things are completely different, I can't say that this is a tenth of that. So you can't say the perfection of a man is, is a certain number of times greater than perfection of a horse. A perfect horse is one thing. It's a horse that can run, can carry things, can do things, can whatever. A perfect human is a totally different thing, right? At least in, in Rambam's understanding, right? But but um, but a dream is always a little bit of prophecy, because in a dream, it's our imaginative faculty tapping into this wisdom that's just there, right? Um, uh, uh, it's an assorted composition comparison. For unripe fruit is the individual fruit itself, but one that has fallen before it was perfect and before it had matured, right? Similarly, the action of imaginative faculty in the state of sleep is also its action in the state of prophecy. It's doing the same thing, right? However, there's a deficiency in it and does not reach its ultimate term. But the imaginative faculty of you and I is deficient. It's not good enough, right? So um, why should we teach you by the means of the dicta made of every lesson? Leave aside the text of the Torah. I, I just brought you the uh, from the... From the Chacham and from Chazal, I'll bring you the Pasuk. It says, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. Right? I speak with him in a dream. Right? So, so God already tells us that a prophecy is a dream. So our dreams are prophecy. Now, what does this mean? Thus he may exalt it has informed us the true reality and quiddity of prophecy and has let us know that it is a perfection that comes in a dream or a vision. 
The word mara derives from the verb ra'o, to see. This signifies that the imaginative faculty achieves so great a perfection of action that it sees the thing as if it were outside. When we dream of things or we have a vision of things, even if it's a waking dream, right? We see it in our minds as if it was real, as if we were looking at it. So when we close our eyes and dream tonight, if you have an image of a tree, it's, it's as real to your brain as if you were actually standing and looking at a tree, right? Your, your brain has the ability to make that knowledge that way. And that the thing whose origin is due to it appears to have come to it by the way of external sensation. You may even smell it. You may feel the breeze in your dream, right? And these two groups, I mean, vision and dream, all the degrees of prophecy are included. I should be, I'm going to explain different degrees on how one perfects those visions and gets them to a higher level of prophecy. But at any level, they are a prophecy. The images that we that our brain itself comes up with, that is prophecy. Um, it is a known that a matter that occupies, and now Rama says something interesting. So um, if you occupy yourself greatly with some, being bent upon and desirous of it while he's awake and while his senses function, all day you are, I don't know, you work in a fish store. And all you dream of every day is slicing the fish into beautiful fillets for sale, right? and scaling them and skinning them and making nice beautiful fillets and putting and your boss tells you when you make the nicest salmon fillets and people come and buy it they'll give you an extra bonus right and all day you're slicing salmon fillets right at night you're going to be dreaming about salmon fillets right because that's what you're involved in all day and to you the height of achievement and greatness is a really nice beautiful pink fillet of salmon right which is juicy and smooth and with no skin and bones in it, it'll just look perfect there in the window, right? So, um, so, so is the one with regard to which the imaginal faculty acts while he's asleep when receiving an overflow of the intellect corresponding to his disposition. It would be superfluous to quote examples, so he's not going to bother with the salmon example like I just did, right? Because everybody knows this, right? If you're thinking about something all day and you're doing something all day and that's what you're involved in all day, then that's what you're going to dream about, right? Right? Because that's what the imaginative faculty, that's what the senses are sensing all day, right? That's what you're involved in, whether it's because your rational faculty is constantly thinking about them or because you're living a life that that's what you're constantly experiencing. You're constantly exposing yourself to views and visions of whatever that thing is. So so after these preliminaries, so you can start thinking how he's going to get to what, what, what a higher level of prophecy is, right? What you should be doing all day and what kind of visions your imaginative faculty is capable of coming up with if you're dreaming about things other than salmon fillets, which aren't that bad. But imagine if you're, what you're dreaming about are things that are inappropriate. What you're dreaming about, thinking about all day is how to take advantage of your friend, how to make a really good deal that gives you the best advantage and puts everyone else at the biggest disadvantage. How you can always be the one that wins, right? No matter who, you, you know, how, how I can get away with defrauding X, Y, Z, fill in the blank, right? And and then imagine where your imagined faculty is going to be when you're dreaming at night, right? What kind of things you're going to be thinking about, right? Or if you're thinking all day about how I couldn't care less when people are suffering in fill in the blank, right? Or or so on and so forth, right? That's If that's your life, if that's what you're thinking, this is why moral and ethical qualities are so important to becoming a real prophet, right? So that your imaginative faculty doesn't dream up of things that you're not supposed to be dreaming. It dreams up of things that are the actual wisdom that, that comes from God. But I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. But I'm just trying to give you a sense of where Ramam is going. After these preliminary propositions, you should know that the case to be taken into consideration is that of a human individual. The substance of whose brain is at the origin of his natural disposition is extremely well proportioned because of the purity of its matter and the particular temperament of each. Now, I'm telling you, remember I told you that if you have a bad arm, no matter what you do, it's still going to be bad if it's compositionally bad, right? But our brains are compositionally good, Ramam is saying. The human brain has its natural ability, right, right, to it, its size and position, where it is in our body, how big it is, what it's made out of, and is not affected by hindrances due to temperament, which derive from another part of the body. Temperament in the Ramam scheme and in Gallen's scheme would come from other parts of the body which give you anger or things like that but the brain itself which is imagining stuff right thereupon that individual would obtain knowledge and wisdom until he passes from potentiality to actuality and acquires a perfect and accomplished human intellect and pure and well-tempered human moral habits right 
So because a person has a brain which is ready to be that imagine a faculty that imagines the right stuff, right? The stuff that is true, right? If that person has well-tempered human moral habits and an accomplished human intellect, in other words, he trains himself to think things through rationally and appropriately, right? He doesn't, you know, he thinks, you know, which requires wisdom, requires intellectual knowledge, then all his desires will be directing, directed to, or to acquiring the science of the secrets of what exists, the knowledge of what it causes, right? It's almost like if you think about it, if anyone of us has ever tried to work through a really serious problem, whatever field it is that we're involved in, right? Whether we're technically, whether we're fixing things, you know, or trying to figure out how to fix a machine or, or whether we're phys physicians or attorneys or whatever it is that we do, if we're stuck with this particularly difficult conundrum and we happen to be experts in whatever field it is that we're doing and we think about it and we read and we, and we learn and we study and then we go back to the sources and we try to reason it out and then we discuss it with our colleagues and it's just not getting there. And then all of a sudden, right, because of all that work, it's just, it's just there. The answer, the imaginative faculty, it's just there, right? So, so, and that's, that's what happens. That's what our brain is able to do, right? His thought will always go towards noble matters and he will be interested only in the knowledge of the deity and in reflection on his works. He will be thinking about knowing God and he will be thinking about God's creation and what ought to be believed with regard to that and what he ought to think about God and his creation. By then he will have detached his thought from and abolished his desire for bestial things. I mean the preference for the pleasures of eating, drinking, sexual intercourse, and in general of the sense of touch. Raman was really uh, not hot on the ish, touch, which we, he associated, as you can see, with sexuality, which is he's really following the example of Aristotle. Nowadays, people have different thoughts on these things, but let's we're learning Rama. Or with regard to which Aristotle gave a clear explanation in the ethics saying that this sense is a disgrace to us. How fine is what he said and how true it is that it is a disgrace. For we have it in so far as we are animals like the other beasts and nothing that belongs to the notion of humanity pertains to it. That that desire for, for, uh, for uh, sexuality is something that's animalistic. It doesn't have any special human component to it. Uh, again, this is completely taken straight out of Aristotle. As for other, and gallon, as for the other sensual pleasures, those for instance that derive from smell, hearing, seeing, they are also found sometimes in animals, although they are corporeal, pleasure for man as man, as Aristotle has explained, but they also have a, a, a more, a little bit higher level of sensation to them. We have been led to speak of things that are not of the purpose of the need for. In other words, I just went a little bit off track, right? But I went off track, not for completely no reason. For most of the thoughts of those who are outstanding among the men of knowledge are preoccupied with the pleasures of this sense and are desirous of them, right? If we're looking at, um, um, uh, if we look at the people who are preoccupied, and here the Ramam the is, 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 is really zeroing in on something important. And, and think for a moment about fraudsters who present themselves as prophets. And this happens... I read the news tomorrow, someone else will be there. And it can happen in every religion, right? The sin that they almost always are guilty of, right? It's almost always a sexual sin. I mean, you can go list the lists in your brain of the people in the last several generations who made the news in just about every religious um, um, uh, uh, denomination that exists on the world, including, unfortunately, our own, of course, right? And then they wonder how it is that they do not become prophets if prophecy is something natural. Maybe they learned a lot. Maybe they intellectually achieved a lot of levels. Maybe they did all the rituals that in their particular religious tradition they thought were supposed to be good. But because they couldn't get out of their mind that, 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 that desire, and that's what they'd spent so much time doing, they wonder why they're not prophets. Well, that's why they're not prophets, because they have to learn how to separate themselves from that selfish desire. It is likewise necessary for the thought of that individual should be detached from this spurious kind. And then secondly, the second thing is, what's the second thing that these people, the flaws that people have, right? It's it's arrogance, right? Right, the spurious kinds of people that think of themselves and all they want is to be uh, the boss. They wanna be the big guy. They wanna be the guy in charge of everyone else. And his desire for them should be abolished. If he wants to truly achieve the levels of prophecy, no matter how smart or how well-versed he is in whatever religion he is, if his desire is to be the, the overlord over others, 
if his desire is to take advantage of his position for himself and not over others, he'll never achieve prophecy, right? Because that's what his brain is thinking and his imaginative faculty is going to think about how to step on other people. When he dreams at night, is he going to be dreaming about world peace or is he going to be dreaming about what I can do to A, get my pleasures and desires satisfied or B, or both, right? How I can take advantage of everybody else for my own gain, right? I mean, the wish to dominate or be held great by the common people and to obtain for them honor and obedience for his own sake. That's what he's going to be dreaming about himself on a mountaintop with hundreds of thousands of people screaming, you, you know, Joe, Schmo, you're the great guy, right? We love you. And talk about how many people came to my inauguration, right? That's what he's going to be screaming, right? Because that's what he's dreaming about, okay? So, so um, and, and if you can catch the references, then you now know my political affiliations and, um, that's just the way it is. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. But um, you can disagree with me. That's fine. But but I'm you know we all have to respect each other. And I'm sorry I got totally off track. But not off track. But that's the point. That's what I'm saying. That's what he's going to dream about. That's what he's going to think about. Because all he's thinking about is himself. And his imaginative faculty, that's all he knows how to imagine. Right? Um, he should rather regard all people according to their various states with respect to, to right? which they are indubitably either like domestic animals or like beasts of prey. This is very hard. I had to go through several translations to see what this means. And this is the way I understand this sentence. In other words, those people who are thinking of only themselves, in that sense, they are just like animals or beasts of prey, right? Right? Because, because he, um, all he's thinking is about his own self-gratification, his own honor, his own whatever. Everyone should be obedient to me rather than thinking about the people for who they really are. Now, um, if the perfect man who lives in solitude thinks of them at all, but, um, he does so only with a view to saving himself from the harm that may be caused by those among them, or harmful if he happens to associate with them, or to obtaining an advantage that may be obtained from them if he is forced to it by some of his needs, right? If, um, you know, a, a, a perfect man who if he's thinking of others at all, right, a person who's, you know, living on a mountaintop, right, the only reason why he thinks of others, right, um, is to thinking of himself of how they could harm him, right, and what advantage he can gain from them. I don't think this word a perfect man means perfect in the sense that he, um, that he's a, a good person. I think he's still talking about the person who's only thinking of himself. And so in other words, when he's among others, all he could think about is how to take advantage of them and what he gains from them. And when he's not among others, to the extent that he thinks about other people at all, the only thing he's going to be thinking about is, um, is, is, is if he should meet somebody, how he can get something from them, right? So in other words, being a man on the mountaintop doesn't necessarily insulate you from this danger, right? Now, there is no doubt that whenever in an individual of this description, right, and what I think he means now is an individualist description, the one that I was describing before, a person who is uh, who is truly moral and ethical, right? That kind of person, right? Um, and I know I had to go through this in the Hebrew and a couple of other translations to get this because this paragraph seemed to jump back and forth. And I might be wrong about this, but this is how I understand it. Um, uh, uh, where am I up to? I lost myself. Um, uh, oh, it's imaginative, which is as perfect as possible, acts and received from the intellect an overflow corresponding to his speculative perfection. This individual only apprehend divine and most extraordinary matters. A person who is who avoids the selfishness and the, um, the, the, the and thinking all day about his own personal desires, but he intellectually perfects himself and morally and ethically per perfects himself. That kind of person, his imaginative faculty will be thinking about those kinds of things and his imaginative faculty will achieve a level of prophecy that, that he will see God and he will see angels and he'll be only aware and achieve knowledge of matters that constitute true opinions and general directives for the well-being of men in their relations with one another. He'll be thinking about how people can get along with, other, with one another. He'll be thinking about world peace, right? He'll be thinking about how can I resolve conflicts among others? How can I bring about a better world? How can I you know, know more about God. It is known that with regard to these three aims set forth by us, namely the perfection of the rational facts through study, right? That part of our brain that thinks actively, we need to study, we need to learn, and it has to be rational. It has to be reasonable. It has to think. 
I learned that A plus B equals C, and C plus D equals E, and so on and so on. I need to think this through. It all has to work. I have to work through real knowledge. And then the perfection of the imaginative faculty through natural disposition, by living a good life, by occupying yourself in good things, and, and, and so on. By doing that way, that changes our imaginative faculty so that our brain imagines goodness and compassion and so on. And the perfection of moral habit through turning away of thought from bodily pleasure, stop thinking about selfish desires and putting an end to the desire for various kinds of ignorant and evil glorification, thinking about how great it is when 100,000 people call you great, right? Um, there are among those who are perfect, very many differences in rank. People at, can achieve that level, but some can achieve it to level A, some can achieve it to level B, some can achieve it to level C, right? There are going to be different levels in rank. And on the differences in rank with regard to these aims, it depend the differences in rank that subsist between the differences, between the degrees of all the prophets. And when I describe to you the different degrees of prophecy, it's how far have you gone up the ladder to achieve that? So all of a sudden, right? So the Ramam is giving us an extremely rationalistic, extremely sensible understanding. He told us, number one, prophecy is a dream. It's something that you and I scientifically know happens. It happens in a brain, right? Which is in a, a, an actual organ. That's a physical organ the Ramam described. And that imaginative faculty, as we all know, is influenced by the kind of lives we live, by what we occupy our minds with and how we occupy our time, right? And if we rationally, right, train our brain to think rationally and reasonably, right, and learn knowledge and intellectually perfect ourselves, and if we live a life that's morally and ethically upstanding and concerned with, with the good to others and not just with selfish desires, we will then automatically achieve a point where our dreams and our visions will be the kinds of dreams and visions that will be prophecy. And in this way, we're all capable of prophecy. Um, and then I, it's hard. I know I'm, I'm getting close to the end, but but I, I got to finish this chapter. And I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm just going to do this last paragraph. Um, you know, I'm going to try, I'm going to run through it a little quick, but there's something in here that's just really, really beautiful and important. You know, and if we go a little over time, I apologize, we'll go a little over. But you know that every bodily faculty sometimes grows tired, is weak, and is troubled, right? This is a bodily faculty. That imaginal faculty sometimes gets exhausted or sometimes isn't 100% right. You know, you're working all day, your arm gets tired. Accordingly, you will find that prophecy ceases when you're sad or angry, right? And he brings proofs, right, that when you're sad or angry, right, that, that uh, you know, and I'm kind of skipping to the top of 373. Why is that? Because when when we're sad or we're angry, those emotions get in the way of our ability to have that perfect ethical and moral state where our imaginative faculty will be thinking about love and compassion and the things that, how to bring about peace among others, et cetera, et cetera. When we're sad or we're angry, we're inherently a little bit selfish, right? Right? And, we, and we're going to lose it. And here the Ramam is, is really giving us a hint. What did he mean when he said that sometimes God takes away and says that you don't get prophecy today, even though you're you're a genius and you're well, you're the greatest, whatever, right? Right? God takes it away because He made the world in such a way that if you're going to be a little bit sad, a little bit angry, a little bit selfish, nope, you're not going to get prophecy, right? It's not going to happen because that's not how the world works, right? This was even uh, so even through though the imaginative faculty did not enter into this. Okay, so it, uh, it, was, it was talking before I skipped that. Um, for as we have mentioned several times, he did not prophesy like the other prophets, but I mean the parables, right? In other words, even Moshe, right? After the after Moshe got angry because of the spies and everything, God withheld prophecy from him because even he didn't get prophecy then. For as we have mentioned several times, okay, this will be made clear later on for not the purpose of this chapter. Similarly, you will find that several prophets prophesied during a certain time, and then prophecy was taken away because it could not be permanent because of some an accident, meaning something that happened in between. This is indubitably the essential and proximate cause of the fact that prophecy was taken away during the time of the exile. Why is it that after the exile started, there's no more prophecy? Here's where the Rama says something beautiful. And, and, and uh, for what languor or sadness can befall a man? And think about this. This is such a powerful thought. In any state that would be stronger than that due to his being a thrall slave in bondage to the ignorant who commit great sins. Right? Grandma is saying... And he, he, there's no, I'm living in a world today where I am a slave to the sultan, right? 
right? Rambam is saying, right? I'm a slave in Egypt now, because that's where he's living when he's writing this book, to a government that runs on 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 on, on evil and bad ideas. I mean, he's, he's this is a, an arrow straight into the heart of our exile under Islam and Christianity, depending on where we live, right? Right, in whom the privation of true reason is united to the perfection of the lusts of the beasts. Right, the people that are ruling us today and that we're subservient to today are people that are ruling for their own power, their own lust, their own desire. As long as we're subservient to that and we're in exile, how can we possibly ever get away from anger and sadness completely? And how can we ever achieve a level of true prophecy? Just think, let that sink in for a minute. Right, this was, um, and he brings some quotes. This is true, and the cause thereof is clear. The instrument has ceased to function. But this will also be the cause for prophecy being restored, and the days of the Messiah may be revealed soon. When Mashiach comes and will ruled by a person who is just and kind and righteous and is out for, for not for himself, but is out for the good of mankind, right? like the visions of Isaiah, that's when we can live in a state where prophecy can exist again. But in a state where we live today, where we're under the, a thrall, slave, and bondage to the ignorant, right? In whom privation of true reason is united to the perfection of the lusts of the beasts. And think about that when we choose our leaders, right? And what kind of leaders we're supposed to choose, right? When we're in bondage to leaders who are can only think about their own selfish desires and needs, right? They will never, ever, ever achieve prophecy in that world. Hence, Prophecy ended at, uh, well, actually during the time of the Second Temple, but certainly ever since we've been in exile. So this chapter had so much in it, um, and I managed to get to it before the hour. But if you, if anyone wants to, I'll, I'll I should, there's so much there. So if you, I'll open the floor to questions. If we go a little bit over time, it's not the end of the world. I have a question. Um, Please. It seems that uh, Maimonides is... Uh, really uh, against selfishness. Now, uh, by, by strict meaning of selfish means concerned with one with with, with one's interests. It mm -hmm. doesn't um, it, it doesn't really have any moral attachment to it. You know, like you you were saying that you were selfish, you're you're bad. Uh, uh, but if your interests are noble, and your concern is then your your selfish interest would. Um, uh... I mean, I, I think that 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 I was using the term selfishness in in its in its. And 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 the Ramam when he's referring to it here, he's referring to its, the 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 bad parts of it. It doesn't mean you're not interested in taking care of yourself at all. In fact, to the contrary, the Ramam is talks about how important it is to you know to nourish our brain and to treat it properly and use it properly, right? So he's so, not against... Um, um, that's, that's a form of selfishness, though. I, I guess you I, could I, say that, right? But, 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 he, but he's in, this, in this context, he's referring, when he's criticizing it, I don't think he's criticizing all actions of self-interest. I think he's just, he's criticizing those who, who's, who's, whose day is, is, is occupied by thinking about, um, you know, his needs... Uh, not his needs, but what he wants to get from everyone else. Um, that, that's the way I see it. But you know, you're making a good point, though. I mean, obviously, you know, self-interest is not necessarily the same as, as, as this kind of selfishness that he's criticizing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Any other comment? There was a uh, phrase, there was a quote in uh, chapter 35 about Israel like uh, unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Yes. That really, that is that that really is an exaggeration, or or, or didn't the meeting encounter take? Yeah, place because it that? wasn't his face, right? It was God's, right? But God said, "Upanilo yero." No human, even Moses, wasn't allowed to see his face. He yeah. just saw him from behind, yeah, right? Yes. That's unfortunately. What I, I mean, to us to get Ramam refuses to describe to us in actual words what really Moshe's vision was like. Like he does say, you know, he, he like I said, you know, he was he God spoke to him directly, not in visions. That he, you know, th those are the things that that Ramam referenced. But he doesn't really. He says, "I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you that it's different. Everything I tell you about prophecies is about all the other prophets." 
what did Rambam really think about Moshe's, um, uh, the nature of the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu? Was it, it se seems like it was a, com it wasn't just a different level. It's not like there was 49 levels and then the 50th level was Moshe's and nobody else ever got there, right? Because that would leave open the possibility that somebody else might one day get there, just like Moshe did, right? It's just that nobody happened to get there, right? But rather, there's levels of prophecy, which, you know, he kind of laid the groundwork for how there's different levels today. And we're going to learn about the different levels as we go on. And then there's Moshe's, which is in a different category, right? And and how and why Moshe's was in such a different category, he's going to leave for us to figure out on our own. I suggested, you know, what, what I thought. I'll tell you that I got my thought. I'm, I have to give credit where credit is due. A lot of my thoughts on on what Rambam really thinks. First of all, it bates a little bit on some reading from Ibn Kaspi, who is the 13th century uh, uh, writer, but also from Kenneth Ziskin, who I quoted a few times, who also mentions this and, and talks about uh, um, how the third book is really where Rambam tells us, not directly, but indirectly, what makes Moshe's prophecy so different because Moshe's prophecy is the entire Torah that's his prophetic teaching right it's the Torah and the Torah has a characteristic and a quality that nobody can ever um supersede and the reason why nobody can ever supersede it is because anyone that gets up today and talks about and 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 this is this is me talking and um I, I and I'll admit a lot of these thoughts were planted in my head by by reading Zizkin and and other thinkers too but um is, is that is that Moshe came into a world where morality and ethics and God were not all connected, right? It was in a world where where you know being moral wasn't necessarily how how you achieved what you needed to achieve. I mean, you know, it wasn't a thing, right? Uh, um, uh, you know, animal sacrifice, human sacrifice was prevalent everywhere. I mean, it was just a totally different. Moshe Rabbeinu came down and said, "There's a God, and God wants us to live an ethical life." Right. He wants us to be kind to others. He wants us to treat others like we would want to be treated and so on and so forth. Moshe came down and put. So anyone else who gets up, they might be able to add a little, you know, uh, change a little, maybe. Well, not necessarily change a little. That's not the right word. But, you know, direct it in a, in a certain direction that might be more relevant to whatever time he or she's speaking. You know, but anyone who gets up and talks about morals and ethics today is riding on the shoulders of Moshe Rabbeinu, you know. And um, and uh, there, so so, and, and if somebody comes up and contradicts the fundamental ethics that Moshe taught us, we would know right away that he's a fraud, right? If someone would come up today and say, "No, you don't have to be honest. You can just lie and cheat," right? Well, I mean, some people might like that if they're the ones on the winning end of the lying and the cheating. But most of us will know right away, right, that that this guy's a fraud. And so, you know, oh, you don't have to listen to Moshe. You can take advantage of other people, whether it's uh, you know, monetarily, sexually, or whatever, you can take advantage of other people, right? Uh, we know the guy's a fraud, or you better know the guy's a fraud, right? Mm -hmm. So, 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 so that that fundamental thing that Moshe set in, in in this world can't be changed. We can ride on his shoulders, but 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 if we tried to set another course, it would be false. It would be wrong. And if we tried to embellish, in other words, and enhance it and bring it forward to today then you're riding on his shoulders. He's doing something very good, but you're not better than him, right? Right. If someone were to get up and talk to a situation today and say, look, we got to do the right thing and show you how the right path is, well, then you're you're riding Moshe's shoulders. You're taking the principles that the Torah taught and you're and you're applying them. You know, and 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 it's not it's not coincidental. Rambam knew and understood that, you know, that whatever positive teachings Jesus, for example, had. Right. You know, about, you know, don't do whatever, you know, we're coming straight from the Torah. The lessons that he had were not new. He was riding the shoulders of the Torah that was taught beforehand. So he can't come and say, oh, now I'm going to erase what Moshe did because it, it doesn't make you can't do that. You can you can if you want to teach something based on it, fine. But if you want to you, if you want to repeal it, you, you can't you can't be Moshe. No one else could be Moshe. But but we'll we'll see because uh, think about it in the back of your mind and think about how um, you know as we learn the next uh, however long it takes us the next uh, at least year and a half two years or so whether what I'm telling you makes sense to you you know thank you thank you all right any other thoughts questions comments.
All right. Well, then hopefully next week we'll all get to it. Somebody said something in. All right. Well, yeah, that was Billy saying you're into the end. Very good. Thank you. Um, so am I. And uh, and the Zohar class uh, isn't starting anytime soon. <laughs> well, maybe one day we'll get there. All right. Have a Thank wonderful you. day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sal. You're welcome. Bye.